very much for the opportunity. It's such an honor. Yeah, no, we're very happy with that. Thank you. If 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 you like, we could give two or three minutes more before okay. to start for for put. Okay, yes, let me start. Um, Okay, colleagues, students, professor, friends. Arigato. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lojas. Uh, gracias. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, good morning from Japan. Uh, my name is Naoko Kumagai. Um, it is honor for me to have this opportunity uh, as a second opportunity to make speech as director of Japan chair at the University for Peace. I'd like to express my gratitude to Dr. Rojas and faculty and staff members and students at the University for Peace. Thank you, arigato gozaimasu. Um, I'd like to also express to gratitude to Professor Kochi Shigeru, who I'm afraid uh, cannot be here today, but he helped me uh, preparing for everything to serve as director of Japan Chair. He is also my colleague at Aoyama Gakuin University. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about the relationship between human rights and geopolitics. And let me show you my slide here. So um, I titled my topic as human rights in the era of new geopolitics. And you might wonder what this new means in geopolitics. So let me explain. Recently, we have witnessed some incidents that show some kind of return of geopolitics. But I'd like to characterize that these events as the advent of new geopolitics. Those events I'm mentioning are the rise of China and the more assertive move of Russia. And recently, actually in 2014, uh, Dr. Russell Mead wrote an article in Foreign Affairs titled The Return of Geopolitics. Then he characterized the rise of China and assertive move of Russia, particularly with the case of the annexation of Crimea into Russia, that there's a growing cases of geopolitical phenomenon, and it is the return of geopolitics. And in case of the rise of China, well, you might know some issues, but I mean, some issues particularly uh, having attention in East Asia is China's controversial maritime claims of a South China Sea. Then, these are really a geopolitical or geographical, I mean, tension, I mean, of China uh, with Southeast Asia. And in case of Russia, it is a tension between Russia and then the neighboring countries, particularly Ukraine. But in recent case, we had the war in Nagorno-Karabakh and Russia assisted Armenia. And we also have the long post-Cold War history of Russian caution against the expansion of NATO towards the East. So it is totally I mean, geographical um, characteristics, but I would say that this uh, geopolitics with geographical um, tension also assumes the value tension as well. This means that the challenges to the liberal order of international order, I'm sorry. Um, it is a challenge to human rights, freedom, and the rule of law and democracy. So I would say that this new geopolitics includes these challenges to values, as well as geographical challenges. And new geopolitics also assume other characteristics, such as the impact of globalization and growing interdependence among states, and the effects of high technology. And accordingly, the areas we discuss in new geopolitics necessarily 
expand. When we used to talk about geopolitics, it used to be land, sea, and air, but nowadays it is also cyber and space. Then I'd like to just review the very basics of geopolitics. Geopolitics is the study about the geographical influences on international relations and national security. Accordingly, geopolitics pays attention to intense competitive relations among territory-based sovereign states. Therefore, the main actors are states in geopolitical studies. And it is assumed that states have different diplomatic tools, but the military force as the main policy tool for states in geopolitical tension. And in geopolitics, there have been little attention to individuals and human rights. It is totally state-based analysis and study. Then here you can see the very classical studies and uh, research of geopolit geopolitics. And when we see the world as such, uh, as you can see in the map on the right side, the world can be classified into several areas in terms of geopolitical importance. And scholars uh, in the early 20th century, actually in the 40s, um, discussed the importance of heartland here in the middle of Eurasia and also the rimland. It is the fringe areas uh, surrounding heartland. Then let me explain these two areas. The importance of heartland was proposed by Dr. Hello, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Harold Mackinder in his book on democratic ideas and re reality published in 1943. And then he originally called this area as pivot area, which is the vast Asian part of Eurasian continent, particularly the east of Ural. And also it has the huge land power with rich natural resources and Mackinder argued that those who control heartland can control the world because of the importance and the resource richness of this area. And also this area connects these vast areas from Asia to Europe. However, there is another argument um, from Nicholas Spikeman he argued that the rimland, the surrounding areas of heartland is important. And as you can see that the rimland is the western, southern and eastern edges of this Eurasian continent. And then those rimland areas place the ocean. And so according to Spikeman, rimland can serve as a buffer between sea power and land power. This means that the rimland faces both the land power from heartland and also sea land uh, from the ocean. Then particularly, the reason why Spikeman paid attention to this sea power is because he himself is, was American. So he was so basically thinking about American strategy in the world as the, his book's title shows. America's strategy in world politics. And he said that Rimland faces those challenges both from heartland and also sea powers. So basically, he argues that this area, this Rimland area, are very, very, and very insecure from a security point of view. And for naval powers such as America, it is very important to have a sound relationship with those rimland areas in order to face heartland. So these are the basic ideas of geopolitics. 
then um, according to this Rimland theory, we can explain many uh, regional wars in the Middle East and in South Asia, Southeast Asia, in terms of the tension between heartland, land powers, and neighbor powers. Then if we pay attention to the current issue of the rise of China, particularly China's claim with nine dashed line over South China Sea, it is Limran China's expansion to the ocean. So actually, China is becoming more like a heartland instead of Limrand and becoming more assertive towards the ocean. Thus having this maritime territorial claim disputes with other Southeast Asian countries such as Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And you can see these blue dashed lines this area surrounded by blue dust lines are the so-called the nine dust line areas claimed by China. Even though the permanent court of justice judged in 19, excuse me, 2016, that this China's, there is no foundation in China's claim over nine dust line territory. However, China said that that verdict is a piece of paper, and then China never follows the verdict from the permanent court of justice. So in a sense, it is a um, tension between sea power, including America and then Southeast Asian countries, and the de facto heartland, contemporary heartland China that is the dispute, geopolitical dis interpretation of the dispute over South China Sea. And as you know, even though I mentioned that the United States are uh, getting involved as naval power, the United States has been conducting the operation of freedom of na navigation in these territories. Then on the other hand, I tried to review the value of human rights. Needless to say, I think, I mean, it is about the norm based on basic trust in human reason and morality. And it has the long tradition in various ways, in various times, in particularly in Western history, from ancient Greece uh, to medieval Thomas Aquinas, the Renaissance, and then enlightenment, but particularly um, the human rights as coded rights and more systematized thought have been starting as natural rights as conceptualized by Thomas Hobbes, John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And basically human rights as natural rights mean the inalienable and universal rights to life, liberty, and property for human beings. And it guarantees the fundamental freedom for people, and it is a freedom from the state, but it also means the protection by the states. These are known as the negative freedom and also positive freedom. And negative freedom basically are about main civil liberties, and the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and fair trial. And protection by the states mean usually the so-called socioeconomic rights, the rights to education, rights to work. And human rights are nowadays coded and guaranteed in national constitutions and international law. Then now I'd like to see the relationship between human rights and geopolitics. Then I would like to suggest that there are three patterns in the relationship between, between human rights and geopolitics. 
Pattern one, human rights ameliorate geopolitical tensions among states. Basically, human rights are coded as I mentioned, and many human rights or human rights related laws uh, have defects and the purposes to ameliorate tensions, geopolitical tension among the states and to promote peace and security. First of all, we have humanitarian law. We have many, particularly from the 19th century, as well, most well known in the 1949 Geneva Conventions. It is about the rule of law. It is about the treatment of wounded soldiers and in the protection of non-combatants. And also the permanent court of justice, which I mentioned in China's nine dash case, um, that was also established uh, at the turn of the century, 20th century in the Hague Convention, along with the development of humanitarian law. And the UN Charter famously known the purpose of the United Nations is to maintain international peace and security. And then in order to serve the purpose, the UN Charter also guarantees that the nations reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights in the dignity and the worth of human person. Also, we have the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This really connects between human rights and peace, the recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of human family. Is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. So again, 1948 Universal Declaration of, P of Human Rights sees the importance of human rights for peace. And we also have the Bretton Woods system. This is basically an um, economic and then financial issue of the IMF and the World Bank, but these were established with the lessons from the interwar period. So that um, with the stable, I mean, uh, financial status of each country and along with the free trade, um, we can have more peaceful, less competitive relationship among the states. And also famously known, we have the so-called democratic peace that the more countries democratized, the more peace world we can achieve, which origin we can see in the perpetual peace theory by Immanuel Kant. And today this theory is also more sophisticated and supported by many scholars. And let me move on to the next slide. Pattern two, geopolitics serves to enhance human rights. This sounds quite a counterintuitive, but I'd like to suggest that because policymakers can have issue linkage between geopolitics and human rights. First of all, um, sometimes geopolitical powers can assert and claim human rights, as we can see the US hegemony in the post-war period. And the more in detail, we have this example of how human rights are used uh, for geopolitical purposes and then vice versa, how geopolitics can be used for the enhancement of human rights. In the case of the Helsinki Final Accord in 1975, in the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, the Soviet approved 
for the first time, the fundamental freedoms which Soviet Union used to deny under the name of the ideology of socialism and communism, because then the reason why the Soviet Union approved fundamental freedoms was because Soviet Union sought to maintain the inviolability of national frontiers, which the, U the Soviet Union gained following the, 19, the Second World War. So there was an exchange of the consolidation of post-war national borders and the acceptance of fundamental freedoms. Then as a result, as we know, we have the universality of human rights significantly guaranteed in, the, in that both socioeconomic and civil and political rights were both approved both by the East camp and the West camp. Then we have the universalization of human rights, both negative peace and positive peace. Then let me move on to the next pattern, which is a pattern three, human rights often escalate geopolitical tension. Well, human rights are very noble value, but however, in terms of its application, sometimes it escalates some geopolitical tension. As we can see from historical cases of nationalism in the 19th century Europe, um, starting with the Napoleonic War, the Franco-Italian War, and the Franco-Prussian War. And in the 20th century, the human rights as embodied as the right to self-determination of all peoples unfortunately had the escalation into armed conflict in the forms of the decolonization wars. The most famously the Algerian war from 1954 to 1962. And also in Asian front, we have the wars uh, in the Indonesia and also famously in Vietnam. And in terms of the self-determination, we also have some secessionist wars with some casualties. Recently, we witnessed the ceasefire of the civil war in Sri Lanka almost 10 years ago. However, the Sri Lankan war lasted more than 20 years. It was a secessionist war uh, by the Tamil group against the majority Sinhalese in Sri Lanka. And the right to self-determination in terms of um, resource nationalism also leads to war, most famously known in the Suez crisis in 1956. And there was also a political crisis in Iran back in 1953 after the attempt of the nationalization of petroleum company in Iran. And in more contemporary cases, we have humanitarian intervention. That is the intervention for the sake of protecting people's lives when people's lives cannot be protected by their own government. And it is a very, very challenging notion and practices by putting human rights as priority over the so-called quite sacred territorial integrity of sovereign states. However, the humanitarian intervention practices record show the quite difficulties in success and the effectiveness in ameliorating humanitarian disasters. We recently have witnessed the case in Libya in 2011, but we know what happened afterwards in Libya. It's true that Colonel Gaddafi, who tried to push down the people's voices in the Arab Spring was toppled 
However, there was a subsequent civil war in Libya. The reason why humanitarian intervention is very difficult is because humanitarian intervention does not necessarily accompany the work of state building. But without stable state building, we cannot have a sustainable protection of human rights. So I would emphasize that often, unfortunately, human rights, the way, depending on the way they are applied into policy could escalate geopolitical tension. Then I'd like to analyze human rights in new geopolitics in contemporary world affairs. We have the challenge of global terrorism. Needless to say, the 9-11 in 2001 and we had the subsequent war, the so-called war on terror. However, in the conduct of the war on terror, we have another challenge. That is the dilemma of the war on terror and the protection of human rights. This means that in America's conduct of the war on terror, there was a significant restriction in civil liberties of American citizens. And also there were some problems in the treatment of those detainees as famously known in the Guantanamo. They were not treated as prisoners of war. They were treated as unlawful combatant and they had no access to lawyers and there was no due process in the treatment of them. And we also have the human rights issues in China. I talked about the rise of China as geopolitical um, issue in contemporary era, but it also assumes another characteristics. It is a challenge to human rights norms, as we see in the, the restriction of liberties in Hong Kong and Wiggle even the United States um, State Department um, characterized the situations in Wigo as genocide. And then this human rights crisis indicates that it is not just a normative issue, it is a hegemonic rivalry issue, as well as ideological rivalry issue between the United States and China. Therefore, this human rights um, issue in China has a wider implication, maybe implication even to the order of international system in the future. And to counter this crisis, there is a some move known as free and open in the Pacific vision. This is the vision to carry democracy, human rights, rule of law and free trade as important values to be, to be prevalent in Indo-Pacific region for serving common goods for peace and sec security, prosperity in the region. Let me show you. Oh, excuse me. Um, let me show you the This map. This is the image of Indo-Pacific region. It is a region a concept to connect Pacific and then Indian Ocean. Then this region should have free trade and also the values of human rights and rule of law for peace and prosperity. That's the vision. Then it is so that it is the kind of containment of China, but it is also the embodiment of these visions.
Then, let me go back to the slide. I'd like to also address the issue of SNS as a product of advanced um, technology. Social network services can serve as double-edged sword. Of course, SNS serves for the promotion of democracy as testified in the Arab Spring. Many young people utilized Facebook, Twitter to gather and consolidate their voices to topple dictatorships. However, nowadays, SNS are used for censorship by the authority. Even with the successful case of Tunisia uh, in the Arab Spring, it is reported that the Tunisian authority has been enhancing more censorship attitude by utilizing SNS. And I'd like to also see the implication of the declining in democracy as a worldwide trend as reported by Freedom House report recently. Maybe some of you have read this, but according to this report, there is an overall trend of the declining in democracy, particularly in the areas of former Soviet Union. You can see in this table that those countries, these are the table, uh, this is the table of the list of countries which used to be under the influence or under the control of the Soviet Union. You can see uh, from uh, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, all the way down to those I mean, Central Asian countries such as Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Ukraine and Uzbe uh, Uzbekistan. And those countries with red highlighted areas their, their scores in democracy has been reduced. That means that their democracy has been deteriorating. And if we follow the democratic peace theory, we can expect more instability, instability in the region. So it's very important to address the issue of this decline of democracy particularly in this former Soviet area. But this trend can be also seen in other parts of the world. We see the struggling of democratization in Venezuela and also in other parts in Africa, such as Mali. So depending on the trend of democracy, we might witness more geopolitical tension in the world. And lastly, I'd like to address this recent move of, excuse me, the redress for historical injustices. This is a movement of demand of apologies and reparations for slavery and colonialism from former colonized countries. And such demands were expressed, but turned into dispute in the World Conference Against Racism in 2001, excuse me, in 2001 and 2009. The United States, Germany, Australia and Canada, they decided not to participate in the 2009 conference because of their criticism of against the demand of apologies and reparations for slavery and colonialism. Of course, they feel I mean, moral uh, responsibility, but they reject any legal responsibility. And as this redress for historical injustice, we have this events of toppling historical figures, statues in the United States and the United Kingdom. Statues of Columbus were toppled in many cities in the United States and also, there were many controversies in the United Kingdom. And one of the controversy was this statute of Cecil Lords, who engaged in this, those colonialism and imperialist, imperialism 
in the 19th century. And his statue is now in the Orioles College at Oxford University. And last year, there was an argument in Oxford University whether this statue should be removed. However, according the Oxford University decided not to remove this statue according to a BBC report last week. But this statue will continue to provide more um, issues for discussion about how to discuss, how to address these people's demand to redress historical injustices. And finally, I'd like to summarize my point. Human rights in the era of new geopolitics. It's very important that we consolidate human rights norms, at least to stop the declining trend of democracy. And second, it's important that we see some issue linkage of human rights and geopolitics as the case of success in Helsinki. Maybe sometimes decoupling of human rights and geopolitics might be important. And also attention to the balance of human rights and the political prudence is important. We have this serious tension in the World Conference Against Racism in 2001 and 2009. And then we also have this turmoil of the toppling of historical figures, of figure statutes. But these tensions and skirmishes should avoid any kind of, es of escalation among countries or among people. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry I exceeded 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh... Naoko, it's uh, quite important your, your view, global view about the geopolitics and human rights. It's not easy to link and see what happened in that area. But we're open the floor for our, our students, our colleagues and Maduka, do you like to to ask something, and then Mark. Well, Mark, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much, um, sir. Um, good, good morning, good evening. Um, thank you. Um, Madam Nayoko, for your lecture, um, as um, Professor or as, as our rector has mentioned, um, it's it's I, I personally I found it uh, I find it um, not easy to link actually geopolitics and 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 human rights, but and this is quite an inter interesting um, lecture because you've provided points where those two converged. Um, now, my question is with regard to your idea of, or to the idea of uh, new geopolitics. Um, you mentioned that one of the manifestations of new geopolitics is the rise of, of China. Um, uh, in, in, in various literatures and in, in, in different fora, um, we have witnessed John Mersheimer, the author of uh, the book, um, politics of uh, a great, great power politics, tragedy of great power politics. And he theorized that China's rise will not be peaceful because there will come a point or that the rise of a hegemon will be refuted or will be um, stifled, stymied by the existing hegemon, which is the United States of America. Since the existing hegemon does not want the rise of another hegemon, um, there will be uh, a conflict. So, so the rise of China will not be peaceful. However, other um, um, political scientists argue otherwise, like Kishore Mwabani saying that China will rise peacefully because China, if we look at the history of China, they don't, they did like uh, 
uh, invade other other areas. If you try to look uh, at, at, at uh, the history of China, they didn't uh, uh, go to other foreign lands and invade this foreign land. So that's that's the idea of of, of Kishore Mubabani. So my question is, uh, do you adhere to to um, John Mersheimer, or do you adhere to, to the, the idea of Kishore Mubabani that China will rise peacefully? And uh, should your answer be that China's rise will not be peaceful? Do you think it will affect the human rights situation, especially in China's neighbor, especially in, in ASEAN, in, 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 in the country where I come from, from the Philippines or other parts of ASEAN, like Indonesia and, Mal and, and Myanmar? Um, do you think that China's rise, if it's not peaceful, will affect human rights situation in ASEAN, considering that um, China and ASEAN and the countries in ASEAN have strong relationships, um, especially with the, with, when it comes to economics? Thank you. That, that's my question. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, let me answer your question. It's a very sharp question, a uh, challenging question. And then that really, I mean, and stimulate my thoughts. Uh, yes, uh, actually, I maybe I'm closer to Mearsheimer in the sense that uh, China's, I mean, rise will not be peaceful. Look quite a tension, but I think the chances of the war between U.S. and China would be really depending on how hot spot issues will be dealt with. I think both really want to avoid any kind of the real armed conflict or exchange of fire. However, um, we have the issue of Taiwan. And so, so we have those, I mean, this hotspot quite hot. So, I mean, we have to be very careful. And then the reason basically, um, I think that it's very, it's gonna be very, very, I mean, uh, intense uh, in the, in China's, I mean, relationship with America, in other words, it, like in Mearsheimer's way, I mean, China's rise is not necessarily peaceful. It's because, as I mentioned, that now we have the normative issue as a source, as one of the ingredients of the conflict. And normative issues are not easy to compromise. Maybe for um, economy, maybe it is easy to compromise, maybe 50-50 or something. We, you can divide something. However, in a value-related normative issue or ideological issue, it's very difficult to compromise. And then if, when I see the stance of China over the past two decades, China is really retreating from democracy. Even China used to say that China has its own way of democracy. But nowadays, China hardly mentioned democracy, the word of democracy itself. So I think that the, in terms of this normative front, China is becoming more uncompromising. And, but at the same time, I have some reservation in my position towards I Amin mean, Shima, in the sense that um, China and the United States are so highly interrelated economically. And that's the difference between the Soviet America Cold, type, Cold War type of rivalry. China and America are so much linked together and uh, globalization. So that also works as a kind of, um, how to say, lead or how to say, a uh, kind of um, the element to soften the tension. And in terms of this, um, the rivalry between America and China, as you mentioned that actually the role of ASEAN is very important because economically both for America and for China, ASEAN is important and also geopolitically. But ASEAN is very, very vigilant not to get be entrapped, entrapped with these two giants rivalry. And as I showed the map of this Indo-Pacific area, um, even though I mean, it is originally proposed by the Japanese government and then ASEAN countries are positive about the vision, but they are not necessarily so overly supportive of the vision because they are cautious that that in the Pacific uh, free and open in the Pacific vision might be more towards Japan and America and then against China. So in that way, I think it's very difficult for 
uh, both um, China and America to get the full support from ASEAN. So in that way, this, I mean, ASEAN's position, this ASEAN's in no interference position actually also serves to ameliorate the tension between America and China, I guess. The, the I floor is open. The question. I have a question if that's okay. Yes, please. Okay, hello, Ms. Kumagai. My name is Kiyomi. Um, I'm from Sri Lanka. Uh, I, had a, I had a question about the um, um, economic uh, free trade agreements that you mentioned. Um, I don't know if I heard or understood correctly, but I heard you say that uh, East African, Southeast Asian and South Asian countries are now uh, more interested to negotiate a um, free trade agreement in order to fight the advancement of, of China and, and as, as a strategy to contain China. Um, and I, I didn't know about that. Um, and I, I would like to um, hear a little bit more about that, if that's OK. And also, uh, the I was wondering about the relationship with that and the Trans-Pacific Partnership that has been proposed by um, the US primarily. So if you could elaborate on that, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let, uh, uh, now let me share the screen of, I'm sorry for the, the inadequate explanation. Basically, this vision of the free and open in the Pacific, uh, as you can see in these two big circles on the map here, uh, has, has two meanings. First, it is the containment of China. It is, I mean, containment of China, but particularly in terms of values, so that um, America and Japan, along with other members in the region, will assist particularly countries are still under democratization so that we have this consolidation of values in this region. Excuse me. And then we also try to facilitate more free economy and free transaction, commercial tr transactions. And thus it would serve as a public good and in terms of this TPP, um, it is originally proposed by America and then Japan actually reluctantly joined this Trans-Pacific um, Partnership, which is the economic agreement uh, in this, I mean, Pacific area. But as you know, uh, Mr. Trump decided to withdraw from TPP and then other countries left decided to survive with among the themselves to continue TPP. So now we have the new TPP, which is called as TPP 11. And then that is also part of this kind of public good side, public goods aspect of this vision that we have this, I mean, free trade area in this Pacific Ocean area, which would also serve as the, I mean, the Indo Indian Ocean areas economy in the near future. So my answer is that this vision has two meanings. First is this containment of China, but in terms of value. And secondly, it, this vision also has the meaning of providing public goods by uh, having a more free and open economic areas, which also means that more political and um, economic assistance to countries under development. But I'd like to add one thing, even though, I mean, my argument sounds like uh, Japan is really, I mean, standing up against China, but Japan knows that we cannot really match China in a sense that, in, first of all, China's GDP is three times as big as Japan's nowadays, even though 10 years back, Japan's GDP and China's GDP were almost equal. So China made a significant growth over the past decade. And then China and Japan, we are geographically very close, while China and America are geographically very, very far away. Therefore, we know that in Japan that we cannot really confront China. And then also Japan depends heavily on China's economy. 
So even though Japan is very cautious about the rise of China, both I mean, economically and also value-based, but we, Japan has to know how to coexist with China peacefully and how to cope with the rise of China in a peaceful manner. That's a bit, very big diplomatic homework for Japan, actually. Thank you so much. Thank you for the great question. Um, uh, Professor Rojas, uh, I think I'm afraid you are muted. Excuse me. I, 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 I'd like to know what is, is, is what kind of linkage you could make between new, new geopolitics, pandemia, and human rights, basically refer to the different way, the different geopolitics refer to the vaccine, refer to the medical equipment and don't support the health as a main public good. Thank you very much, Dr. Rojas. I think that's very important and an ongoing point. Yes, I mean, nowadays we pay attention to human lives more than ever. That's why this I mean, pandemic matters. I mean, I mean, in terms of how to tackle with this pandemic matters. But that's why, as you also, I mean, indicated, the, for example, the vaccine diplomacy matters for countries because um, human rights matter for any country. That's why vaccine diplomacy works because that will be highly appreciated. But the provision of vac vaccines, particularly from China, can also be translated into China's diplomatic power. Therefore, um, I think that really shows the new diplomacy, I mean, a new geopolitics. I mean, in the traditional geopolitics, we just thought about what kind of natural resources are available from this region, from geopolitics, I mean, from this um, uh, topological, I mean, feature of land or the location of land. But we see the importance of value being linked to this, I mean, state power relationships, competition. And I mean, that is also linked with this, I mean, geopolitical competition as well. For example, um, it is said that as a cliche that the Caribbean area is the backyard of the United States. But nowadays, China is having more influence over this area with vaccine uh, diplomacy. I read the news that um, uh, some countries, um, maybe it was, I, I think it was El Salvador. Uh, uh, no, it was uh, Nicaragua. Uh, no, sorry, um, it was El Salvador, I think. Um, has a difficulty in getting vaccine. And then there was a deal from China that if you have a diplomatic relationship with me, I will provide vaccine. So it is um, over vaccine, the, that area, the Central America is becoming the arena of the rivalry between Taiwan and China. That also means that the rivalry between America and China. Thank you very much, uh, Naoko. And I, I think uh, Koki has some question. Uh, yes, I have one question. Uh, may I have our time to ask her one question? Okay, Hi. so, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so, Ms. Kumangai, uh, thank you for your time and giving us uh, our, such a great lecture, it, which was very interesting to me. Uh, and I have one question. So why why uh, China has changed their attitude, uh, in other words, from being friendly to challenging, uh, being, uh, challenging with uh, 
the United States, uh, because I think uh, previously uh, China has tried to adapt itself to the liberal world order. For example, in 1986, uh, China uh, were, became a member of WTO. So it means uh, they wanted to follow the current world new order. And also, um, like uh, once uh, some uh, political scientists uh, mentioned that uh, stakeholder theory uh, between the United States and China. So it means uh, they, at least they seem to have intention to collaboratively, collaboratively maintain the world order, world order. But uh, all of a sudden, China has turned the attitude uh, like to challenge the rule-based or democracy-based disorder. So could, if it's possible, could you tell us there are some possible reason why uh, China has changed their attitude towards the world? Yeah, this is my question. Thank you very much for the great question. Uh, I think it's very difficult to see very inside of China because that country is not totally open. But there are many, many, I mean, several, I mean, arguments. Uh, the one of the explanation is that um, China um, is not does not have any very grand strategy about how to organize the world. I mean, after replacing the United States, then China is just reacting to whatever is needed in an opportunistic way. For example, the nine dashed line in South China Sea. That is for China to survive for the one party system. So that is a, the nine dash line comes from the domestic agenda in the sense that, um, let me show you. China needs. China needs natural resources from embedded in South China Sea, because as you can see, China, which is a very large country, but which has a very short coastline here. And even off the coast, China faces Taiwan, the Philippines and Japan, South Korea, all are close to America or the allies of America. That's why China is trying to go to Myanmar, but at the same time, China wants to go out anyway here in this very short coastline. So, and then the reason why China wants to go out is to get the natural resources here. And then that is to, in order to maintain the economic growth in China. And then nowadays, economic growth is the only raison d'etre for um, the, for the maintenance of this one party system in China. And in order to maintain one party system, the Communist Party of China should make people satisfied with their lives. So it's quite a materialistic reason why China goes out to South China Sea. It is not based on any grand strategy of this China central world vision or something. So, Maybe we can understand that the China's, I mean, aggressiveness recently is to meet the demands of people and to keep the one party system in China. Otherwise, maybe people will speak up. Like the, the more middle class we have, the more voices, maybe more democratization. We actually, that is what America expected, but that was not how things hold, I mean, unfolded. That's why. Mr. Pompeo, the former state secretary of the United States said that it was really a big mistake for America that America reproached with China in 1970s. But anyway, that is one explanation So pragmatism. And another explanation I learned is that it is this, um, the structure of governance uh, in, the, in the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, now we have Mr. Xi Jinping and he tries to make himself as like, um, like um, I don't know how to say, uh, quite charismatic leader, like Mao Zedong, and to promote more like an individual worship as a leader. And 
actually that attitude of Xi Jinping is not really liked by some of his um, entourages. So there is a tension within this, I mean, ruling circle in a small ruling circle uh, within the, the Chinese, I mean, Communist Party. And then those who are surrounding him, they have experiences in study abroad. So they know how things work in international society. But if we see the regime of Mr. Xi Jinping, his career is basically quite domestic. So he doesn't know how to I mean, deal with, I mean, international society. That's why he's more I, myopic and becoming more uh, dogmatic like Mao Zedong, even though Mao Zedong has uh, some international experience. But so that is more, the second explanation is that it is based on his the career and the characteristic and the thought, unique thought of Mr. Xi Jinping. Uh, which makes more international cooperation more difficult. As we collectively mentioned that China used to be more, um, uh, in a sense, modest and more cooperative with international society. But at the same time, I try, I try to address that China is also very willing to cope with America in some common agendas such as global warming. So in that sense, um, we, we should not really, I mean, judge China as really um, becoming a unilateral and too much dogmatic and uncompromising. Thank you. Now, of course, some of our, our colleagues make the question refer to, we saw basically your view about China to the Global South and and she said it's basically a negative intention. But if we put the view of the Jews could be more similar in their intentions to take control of the global south. And in the case of the Russia, is they have some activity in some part of their area of influence in that way and make some similar and parallel to the China. You are, you are mute. Excuse me, uh, could you please repeat your question again? One of, of our colleagues who hear you say you express the intention of the China to the global south and qualify this is a negative intention of China with their, their attitude referred to the the Red Sea and, and other, as you explained clearly. But the question is, if we look the the attitude of the Jews to the Global South, could be more or less the same? And if we look the attitude of the Russia referred to some area of, of influence could be the same. And in that way, we have three important global actors with the same attitude to take control of the Global South? Thank you very much. Um, that's quite true that usually hegemons, they utilize norms in a very convenient ways. Uh, and then the United States also has double standards. Uh, we can see the case of the dirty war in uh, Argentina and also, um, I mean, I mean, America's double standards in the Middle East. And so in that way, and also I also should mention this, that I mean, there is uh, some um, argument that criticism about China's One Belt, One Road project, that that is a new type of colonization with the, the recent case of Hanban Tour in uh, the port in Sri Lanka. However, the close uh, attention shows that this deal in Habantor in Sri Lanka is not really uh, China's colon new colonialism. It is more like that the Western powers are, are willing to help Sri Lanka in financially, and then it was the last resort for uh, Sri Lanka. So we have to be careful. I understand that. I mean, not to over 
um, estimate America and then not to underestimate China. And then that including Russia, that these, I mean, three main giants, they have their own agenda and their One thing I can be sure is that still there is a difference between America and Russia and China. The difference is that America openly upholds the values of freedom and liberty. So we can still ask America and put the burden of proof or burden of explanation on America when America's conduct is against it's double standard based or is against the freedom or liberty. So in that way, I mean, the current liberal order as set by America is very important. But if this, these giants no longer uphold those basic values of liberty, freedom, human rights, I think there is no way for us in a discursive way to persuade those giants to address their double standards or their, address their problematic attitudes. Thank you very much. I think we have on on leave some some minutes of the one hour time for your conference. Thank you very much because I think it's uh, quite important try to understood the complex relationship between human and the rest of the world, and also how to look the interference of the different ideologies referred to geopolitics and human rights. I think your conference is very good and focused in, in Asia, and I am sure all the, the persons who attend were, are very happy with your conference. Thank you very much, Naoko. And thank, thank you, you very for much, the, the Professor, and thank who... you very much for the very sharp and uh, thought-provoking questions. No. I can see how, uh, the standard of the university. I am reaffirmed how prestigious the university is, as Professor Koji said to me. Yeah. Thank and, you very much. And I, I, I like to to remember in in, in some moment. I, I think in September, Naoko, we organize a specific course. Basically about the, the the history of Japan in the peace constitution, yeah. but uh, that also I mean touches upon these issues of the relationship with America with China. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Good day in Japan in Asia. Good night here in in the Americas. Thank you, thank very, you very much for much. coming and thank you very much for your time and. Gracias. Thank you very much. Excellent conference. Now, very happy thank you very that. much. Good evening. Good evening to Good evening. everyone. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu.